Uh, Mike Ryan, and this is a question for the NRC. Uh, is the NRC aware that a guard at Fort Calhoun shot himself in the leg? Yes. Are you aware that he was fired? I'm not aware that he was fired. Okay. You haven't been told about that I've heard of uh, Personnel matters on issues like that generally don't come to us. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Prospero. Uh, where does the shooting show up in the accident graphs that you've been showing us? That was not at work. Pardon? That was not at work. My microphone that the gentleman got injured was not at work. Did, did not occur at work. Okay. Uh, was this uh, uh, a weapon that he would use at work? Negative. Okay, okay I'm going to go into uh, a little something else. Are you from the Iowa Sierra Club? Am I who? Iowa Sierra Club? No. Okay. No, I'm, I'm a rate payer in Omaha. Oh, okay. Thank you. One thing I would appreciate that one person talks at a time and the Mr. Brown is trying to talk. So the is going to be trouble for meeting them. I just want to speak up. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, since at least 2003, uh, Fort Calhoun has been out of compliance with its license regarding flood protection. Despite the NRC's yellow finding in 2010 uh, for flood protection violations, Fort Calhoun still has not fixed the problems. In fact, most NRC inspection reports since 2010 cite additional violations regarding two aspects of flood protection at Fort Calhoun. Uh, it's disconcerting to find that the restart checklist basis document indicates at item 2.8 that facility structures, systems, and components are to be restored to the condition that existed prior to the 2011 flood. The inspection reports demonstrate clearly that the pre-flood conditions of the plant were inadequate and failed to comply with OPPD's license. Why does the restart checklist basis document indicate that OPPD need only restore the plant to pre-flood conditions instead of requiring full compliance with Fort Calhoun's license? Yeah, I'll answer that question. First of all, the, you know, what, what we're ensuring is that anything that was affected by the flood was fixed. And definitely, if anything is not in compliance with your licensing or design requirements, we'll be addressing that also. Uh, we're not, the intent of what was stated in that wasn't to just restore it to how it was if it wasn't in the proper condition to begin with. Uh, matter of fact, I think you made a point of, of noting that we are identifying issues that you know, weren't uh, uh, proper. We're writing violations on those, and the licensee is fixing them. So we're, we're not just ensuring that they restored something to how it was before. We're ensuring that not only it is restored, but it is restored. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to the first comment card and question. And it kind of puts the question to the NRC, but I want to send it to uh, Fort Calhoun Station first and then. Probably just a quick follow-up with the NRC. The NRC panel seemed to be surprised by OPPD's response in regards to the raw water pump elbows. Does OPPD have the regulatory elbow room to ask for a license amendment for the raw water pump piping? Yeah, I'll start with that, Ron. I'm sure you and Bruce can add. And, uh, as we discussed, and as was discussed in the most recent inspection report. We believe we've made a, a significant improvement in the strategy uh, with the modifications that we made uh, to, to control cell level. Uh, what we're standing back and looking at right now is, uh, is recognizing that that change uh, for all intents will probably require a license amendment request. And before we put that strategy into implementation and into use in our procedures, we, we would follow the process for that. 
Bruce Bothell. No, I think that's correct. As I indicated, I mean, I, we're eventually going to probably submit a license amendment request for the bypass modification that I talked about during my presentation. It just hasn't been fully vetted through the management chain that we have agreed to do that. But we're leaning in that direction. Yeah, and, I, and I think from, from our perspective, I mean, we've, we've, we've been having a lot of communications on this issue. And uh, uh, there, there's really not any surprise, uh, maybe my question, People might have thought that I was surprised, but uh, we, we've been actively communicating on this issue. Uh, I think the only question that I had was when I read that, that they were evaluating whether or not they were going to classify the piping or not. Uh, I, I wasn't aware that they were at that state today. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had our exit, and uh, you know, we haven't heard from them yet if they plan to deny the violation or accept the violation. So uh, typically, if a licensee tries to deny something, we, we hear about it you know, through communications first and then in writing. And since I hadn't heard anything, you know, that was my element of surprise is I wanted to find out if you were to, to deny it before we talk about it. Thanks. Okay, I've got a question over here, and then I'll go right back to the line. Uh, my name is Bill Collins. I'm a rate payer. Uh, here's my question. This is uh, towards the OBD management. Given the 2011, 2011 electrical fire of the 480 volt electrical bus, which caused extensive damage and cost millions to repair, how do you explain the hundreds of fire impairments which are unresolved and include metal roll doors and switch gear rooms meant to contain the spread of an electrical fire? Yeah, I'll start with that. Re recognizing it, we are in a refilling outage right now. On the back end of a refilling outage, we do have you know, a fair amount of equipment out of service. And so part of that is is putting a fire impairment in place as well as, some, in many cases, a continuous fire watch and compensatory actions. It's part of our department readiness. It's part of our system readiness. It's part of our plant readiness. And this is even in, a, I'll say, a normal refilling outage. We would look at backlogs of all deficiencies, including fire impairments. And our goal is to drive that down to as low as reasonably achievable, especially as we continue to work through work windows, uh, make systems operational. And in some cases, that's you know, a door that might be propped open right now so that would facilitate work going out of the plant. And that would be very aggressively scrubbed and reduced, as I mentioned, uh, to the minimal level as we, as we approach systems ready to restart. So what we've also done is uh, log condition reports, action reports, work orders, all that type of stuff is being coded for the proper time when we need it. Some for fuel, some for heat up, some for start up. And we're in the process of doing all that as we speak. And there are some of those very items on those ones. Yeah, and then I'll just close in. in uh, this is an additional item that Nuclear Oversight has, uh, has pointed out to us and we've taken actions on it. It's, it's called the control of combustible material. As I mentioned, even with the extensive work going on, how we maintain housekeeping in the proper order. Uh, we've established a full-time fire marshal uh, as a new position to go take, uh, to take the, the central lead on site for all things fire related. There's an engineering component, there's a maintenance component, there's an operational component, and that fire marshal would be the, the head on the horse per se uh, to go drive actions and to keep that very visible uh, in front of us and in front of the management team as a priority work item you know, going forward if, if Fire parents, you know, continue uh, to, can continue to come up, and that we work them off in an aggressive manner. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Bernie Tompkins, right here. I've uh, been around here for 50 plus years since uh, '62, and used to fly around the uh, plant out there at Fort Calhoun. Never thought much of it as a risk working uh, at the underground uh, building at SAC. We had a nuclear bomb from maybe the Russians that would incinerate you. However, that's uh, long gone now, and uh, the biggest risk I see is the nuclear plant. I'm not against the nuclear plant, but I am very disappointed in the officers of uh, the OPT, OPPD, or, or OPD, OPPD over the years, and uh, the board members that never addressed what we're addressing here, 
And uh, I think that uh, the oversight of the uh, NRC is most important to maintain the safety of the city of Omaha. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Mary Ann Cresman. I live on 1902 O Street in Omaha. The NRC's public outreach efforts regarding Fort Calhoun Station needs a lot of improvement. It has been more than four months since the NRC's last public meeting in Nebraska. Regardless how busy the NRC is, public meetings should be convened in Nebraska at least every two months so that the public has a fighting chance to be current with the developments. The NRC's testimony to the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners on January 8th of this year regarding its public outreach overstated the number of public meetings held in Nebraska last year. O350 panel vice chair Louise Lund incorrectly told the commissioners that the panel had conducted seven public meetings in Nebraska. In reality, the NRC held only five public meetings in Nebraska and one open house last year. In addition, more time needs to be devoted at each meeting to public comments and questions. The NRC's February 12th meeting held in California regarding the San Onofre nuclear plant used a format that should be used here. Segments for public comment were interspersed between several presentation segments during the first half. Then the second half was devoted entirely to public comments and questions. This format, which is a much more effective communication technique, avoided the mind-numbing blocks a repetitive presentation that occurs at our meetings. Another problem is that the NRC has again chosen the Doubletree Hotel for a meeting venue, even though it is inconvenient for many members of the public. Parking is a major hassle, finding one's way around in this labyrinth is difficult and frequently discourages people from attending. <clears throat> Concerns about this location were brought to the panel's attention last year with several suggestions of better venues. Each also has easier access from the interstate. <clears throat> I do not understand why the NRC persists in holding its public meetings in poor venues except to discourage attendance. A further problem is the NRC's needlessly slow posting of meeting videos regarding Fort Calhoun. The NRC has claimed that posting has to wait for transcription which takes a month or longer. In contrast, the videos of the public meetings the NRC holds regarding the San Onofre plant are posted without transcription within a day or two of those meetings. When the videos for the Fort Calhoun meetings are eventually posted online, they frequently use a low quality instead of a high quality setting. This makes the video and sometimes the audio look and sound like the meeting was held underwater. This also has been brought to the NRC's attention, but the problem continues. Another example of extremely poor audio is the December 12, 2012 public meeting held at the NRC headquarters regarding the containment internal structure, uh, in containment internal structure problems at Fort Calhoun. The audio for the public who attempted to listen by phone was so poor that it was effectively inaudible for most of the meeting. Yet another problem is the NRC's untimely and inconsistent posting of documents on the special website. Rather than being posted within a few days of the document date, the NRC generally waits until shortly before a public meeting before posting most of the documents. <clears throat> Some key documents, like the December 31st 2012 integrated inspection report still have not been posted. It's time the NRC steps up its game and fixes its glaring public outreach problems. First, appreciate the feedback. There is room for improvement. In regard to this venue, you know, just, we, we try to change it in different areas, get it closer to where but, it, but we also receive feedback from folks that they wanted to be here. Uh, well, we're, we're trying to be honest with that. But I do appreciate your feedback regarding the, the, the teleconference that makes it difficult. We need to improve in that area as well as the, the, the course posted earlier. We'll work on that. And as a 
video that's going that's a that's a challenge. We've heard it now several times. And we'll take it out and see if we can improve it. One thing on the videos, it's it's funny that you brought that up. We we've, we've had a lot of challenges with the uh, <coughs> company that uh, does the transcription for us. So Laura Yuselbink and I decided that the next one, what we're going to do is we're going to immediately, and we have to post it on our website anyway with transcription. But in order to get it out there quicker, we're going to immediately post it to YouTube uh, as we do a lot of our other meeting minutes while we're waiting for the transcription to get done. And then when the transcription's done, we'll have that one also on the public web page uh, in addition to what we have on and I'll just add, you know, we, we try to use technology to the best of our ability to, to support the public being involved in what we have to do. Uh, I know with respect to posting documents on our special oversight website, uh, which is a requirement, but we're doing it to support public outreach. Uh, I know that for the revised Cal and for the revised basis document, I had those documents put onto that website the same day, if not the day after, uh, we <coughs> some documents into Adams. Uh, you, you did mention there was a December 31st report. Uh, that one might have not gotten posted, ma'am. I'd have to go look. Uh, but uh, but we, we do try uh, to get those reports and those, those uh, documents put into that site as soon as we can. Uh, and maybe if you want to talk to me after the meeting, because I'm not sure if, if you're aware, but you can go to the Anderson's website, and, and I, I don't know exactly where it's at, but I do know there's a place where you can request to receive every document instantly that the NRC puts into the public record related to Fort Calhoun as soon as it's, as soon as it's issued. And I <coughs> tell you that would be a bunch of a much better mechanism for you to get everything instantly versus waiting to go to that website. To get it. And, and I, I, I know we've got documentation up at the front desk that, that tells you how to do that. And if you don't mind coming and talking to us afterwards, we'll be more than happy to help you get that. I have more Taylor with the audit board. Chapter of the Sierra Club. I have a question for the 0350 panel. Looking at all the information and the reports that we have, we know that uh, there were problems at Fort Calhoun with the containment internal structures, support columns and beams. It's going to take a lot of work and changes in order to uh, repair those and bring them up to uh, proper functioning and design standards. Uh, the flood protection uh, is going to take a lot of work and changes to bring that up to standards and if OPBD uh, is accurate in what they've said, they're going to go above that. That's going to take a lot more uh, work and changes to the plan. Uh, there are reactor containment pen penetration seals that have to be modified because they were Teflon Teflon has been um, known since the 1980s not to be the appropriate uh, material to use for those penetration seals. Um, my understanding is that, uh, that not all the design basis documents are uh, accounted for, some are um, um, missing or not are being able to be found. Uh, we know that the plant was built on karst geology, which is fractured limestone bedrock, and that was known at the time that the plant was first licensed. And then the most recent inspection report dated March 11th notes two flooding mitigation changes that should have required a license amendment, and OPDD did not seek a license amendment. So given all of that, why is the NRC not requiring OPPD to apply for a license amendment? I, I don't think we've ever said that we're not requiring that. The, the, the 
board said that those modifications, in our opinion, require an amendment. Uh, and uh, you know, the licensee has 30 days to respond to that and tell us if they uh, agree with that or not. Um, so, I guess to answer your question, we're, we're not saying It's more than just that last inspection report, it's all the other items that I indicated that are going to take a lot of changes, a lot of uh, design and construction modifications that the dean would think would require a license amendment. Yeah, and I, I guess ra rather than go through the list that you gave, and that is a good list, uh, there's, there's a number of issues that we're currently looking at that may require licensing amendments. Uh, you know, if I wanted to talk directly each one of yours with the containment structure, Possibly not, because the licensee is looking at restoring the structure to its licensing basis. With respect to the flood, we just said maybe, uh, you know, right now, based on the mods they're doing, we would say yes, a licensing amendment is needed for the modifications that they made. For containment penetrations, it doesn't look like a licensing amendment will be needed because they're restoring compliance to the original licensing basis. With respect to the DVDs, you know, I don't know how that ties to a licensing amendment without knowing the specifics of what element of the DVD uh, that we're talking about. But, but I guess what, what I'm getting at, sir, is, you know, you, you bring up a great question. And it's a question that we are communicating with the licensee about because there, there, are, not, there are a number of, of issues that may require licensing amendments. The licensee is aware of that. We are aware of that. And we're currently working through that uh, question right now. And, and you know, I, I can't tell you exactly what state we're at, because like I said, we're waiting for the licensee to complete their evaluations. So the license amendment will require, would that be before we start? <coughs> well, yeah, the, uh, yeah, part of the restart checklist, the specific line item and action that we have is to identify the issue have a licensing amendment as an uh, item six that we would review and to make sure that the issues that require a license amendment are the basic of the request and the cost before we start. So that's a specific item to when we start with uh, Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one more from the line and then I'm going to go over to the other side of the room. Colleen Augustin, um, comments and a question. It's good to see the revision of the restart checklist and the basis document. The three chief additions reflect significant long-standing problems at Fort Calhoun Station, which absolutely must be resolved before restart is considered. Congressman Terry's recent criticism of the NRC is off base. To assure public safety, we in the Midwest need and want thorough, rigorous, and proactive inspection and evaluation by the NRC regarding Fort Calhoun. We are also looking to the NRC to ferret out additional problems and expand the checklist and basis document further as additional deficiencies are revealed. If the NRC hasn't done so already, it needs to brief Congressman Terry so he has an opportunity to, under to correct his understanding regarding the restart checklist. That said, it is necessary to again point out that the restart checklist still fails to meet Manual Chapter 0350 requirements. No information whatsoever is provided regarding status for most items. Also, the root causes and corrective actions that require disposition or resolution prior to restart are still not listed as required. On top of that, neither the checklist nor the basis document is readily accessible for laypersons. Despite NRC promises previously, one cannot in fact search on the VIO members and addicts and find the violation in the relevant documents as Mr. May claimed at the November meeting. It's disappointing that the restart checklist basis document does not yet actually serve as a tool for the public to track developments in a timely fashion. This is because the NRC has not updated it as frequently as Mr. Hay promised at the last meeting. He committed to updates every six weeks. Instead, it's taken about four months since the original for us to see the first update. The jargon used in the basis document needs explanation. It seems evident that the term closed in the status column does not necessarily mean the problem is solved. 
Based on my review of thousands of pages of NRC inspection reports, licensing and event reports, etc., it's clear that action items are frequently closed by OEBD without taking appropriate action. The NRC's March 11, 2013 inspection report also has a couple examples of closure without final resolution of the problem. These relate to OPBD's failure to obtain prior NRC approval for flood mitigation strategies. So, even if all the 400 plus items in the checklist basis document were designated as closed, that does not necessarily mean that all the issues at this point are resolved. So this is a question for the NRC. Where an issue is identified by the NRC during inspections and evaluations, will the NRC require that issue to be fully corrected in order to consider restart? Not just addressed, but fully, fully corrected, yes or no? That's what the issue is, frankly. If, it's a, if it is a safety issue, it needs to be addressed prior to time we start to get the whole to this time we will verify that. But not all issues are related to the impact of the safety operation of the company. Does that answer your question? And you have a lot of, covered a lot of areas, but let me cover one that regarding uh, Congressman P. Terry and his comments regarding the NRC and the Terminatory Action Letter. Yesterday, I came myself met the Congressman Terry and we explained why, what the issue were that was added to the Terminatory Action Letter, why it was important from a safety perspective, and he didn't understand that. And one thing from uh, Congressman Terry, he understands that the safety of poor poor county is paramount. So you explained that to him. Did something yes. he didn't know? Excuse me? Yes, he did. He did we explained it to him. Thank you. Okay, just, just a level on. Just to answer the question about updating uh, the basis stock, and I, I will agree with you. Uh, you know, it's been four months since we updated that basis document. Uh, I'm not going to make any excuses for why it took so long, uh, other than there's a lot of things that, that we've been building with. But I will tell you, if you read our inspection reports that we issued, each one of those inspection reports, if an item is closed, that report will discuss what was inspected, how it was inspected, and the basis for its closure. And it, it will state exactly what item in the basis document it, it closed. So as long as you got one copy of the basis document, if you get the reports, you can keep track, you know, every time a report is issued, what the status is. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you that, every, and I don't think I ever told anybody every six weeks we would do the basis document. Every six weeks we do an inspection report, uh, but, but we're not going to be updating the basis document six weeks also. Uh, but, but we are going to be updating the basis document when there's enough of a reason to update it. Uh, you know, recently we revised the Cal and we added things to, to the basis document. Soon we'll be issuing a number of team inspection reports that, that will address a large number of these of these uh, basis document items. And, and then definitely we'll be updating the basis document so that you can keep track of that. You know, the bottom line is, I apologize that we're not, you know, updating that document as much as you would like. Uh, if I could, I would update it every six weeks, but uh, but it's just, you know, I, I have to balance what we can do, and uh, I'll, I'll try my best to do, to do it as often as I can. Hello, uh, my name is David Steinhauser, right here. Um, this question is pointed toward the Fort Calhoun staff. Um, given the extended duration of the station shutdown, uh, what has been changed in regards to the storage of the spent fuel rods? Um, what is the expected length of time of station operations after restart until the storage pool or pools will reach capacity? And when capacity is reached, will an additional storage pool be constructed or the oldest fuel be transferred to on-site storage tasks to another temporary storage location or to a permanent storage site should one ever be constructed. Thank 
How long was it uh, before the fire was discovered? I'd have to look at my notes, Mrs. Ryan, but I'm, I'm talking, you know, very, very short amount of time because you have indications in the control room, you would have indications in the control room if you had an issue with the fire uh, based off of uh, gauge indications that would dispatch somebody there to look at it if they could figure it out immediately. Okay, so you don't know exactly. Not, not off the top of my head. I've got notes. I can find that out. For you. Okay. Uh, we can, we can provide some additional information on that question. It, it appears that it may have caused some loss of electric power. Is this, a, in this case, how long was there a loss of power? Are you saying it wasn't? There, there wasn't a loss of electric power to anything that was safety related. I mean, anytime you have a fire in any kind of a load center or breaker, you're obviously going to lose power to that because you have to, to uh, get rid of power to stop the fire. But there was no substantial, I mean, we're only talking about the individual load center and the components off of that, not a, a site-wide 480 volt bus issue like they had in June 2011. Okay, but, but how long, or if it wasn't safe to relay it, but still there was a loss of power. If you're not safe to relay it, then how long was that a loss of power? It, it was an individual component in the intake structure, and I believe it was associated, it was eight or nine minutes Okay. Um, and the system structures and components that were affected were just what? I mean, you know, it's not safe to build it like what? I believe it was a sump pump. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't so I believe it was a sump pump. A sump pump. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, just uh, in the order of, uh, um, just in order to uh, bring the meeting to a close, I'm going to address everybody left in the line. Brief, and if you have any questions, we still have those feedback forms back there. You can write a question on there, and we will uh, we'll get back to you. Lynn Moore, I echo the comments of the two previous speakers regarding the O350 panel do list. In effect, the things they need to work on. Uh, perhaps uh, you could regard those comments as a type of a checklist for yourself. And to clarify, the concern about the venue here is there are better locations in Omaha. It's not a question of between Omaha and Blair. It's a question of that when you meet in Omaha, there are many better venues that are more convenient, have better parking, etc. And those suggestions were provided to the panel last summer. Anyhow, I'm confident that you'll be able to uh, rectify all these things if you direct attention to them. In December, OPPD revealed that more than a third of the columns and beams in the containment building, 47 of 135 beams and 5 of 14 columns, do not conform to Fort Calhoun's license. They don't meet acceptance criteria for working stress and or ultimate strength. OPPD indicated that loads on the beams and columns cannot support the loads they were designed for, much less the new power upright loads. OPPD also revealed in December that the containment internal structures were not built as designed. It also disclosed the calculations regarding these structures are incorrect, incomplete, or missing. In addition, incons inconsistencies exist between calculations and drawings. OPPD admitted that it has known since the 1990s about the missing calculations, but decided not to reconstitute them. NRC Branch Chief Michael Hay stated at the January 8, 2013 briefing of the NRC commissioners that margins of safety at Fort Calhoun have clearly been affected because of these problems. OPPD argues that despite its nonconformance with Fort Calhoun's licensing basis, the containment internal structures are operable for outage conditions. Incredibly, OPPD proposes to wait to make any modifications to address these problems until after restart. However, the NRC recently cited OPPD a violation for failure to conduct an adequate operability determination. Among other things, OPPD got it backward. Rather than adopting a requirement to demonstrate that it is safe in order to proceed, OPPD adopted a requirement to demonstrate that it was unsafe in order to disapprove the action. 
OPPD's failure to build the containment internal structures according to design documents strongly suggests that many more system structures and components may not have been built to design specifications. The NRC needs to investigate design documentation, including all calculations plant-wide. The NRC's investigation needs to look both at the extent of the nonconformance and why it occurred. Focus should not be limited to the non-conforming structures that OPPD is now seeking to justify. It's also critical that the NRC assign for this rigorous review personnel who have adequate expertise to see through OPPD's modeling. The meeting held in December at NRC headquarters regarding this problem was extremely hard to hear for the public attempting to listen in. Plus, the slides that were discussed during the meeting were not available to the public until well after the meeting. So the, the public had very little meaningful opportunity to understand what was being discussed or give informed input. Will the NRC hold public meetings in Nebraska devoted to the containment internal structure problems at Fort Calhoun? I uh, talked about a lot of things, and uh, I guess to answer your last question first, will we have a public meeting in Omaha to discuss the containment infrastructure issue? Uh, right now, I, I can't say yes or no to that. Uh, what I will tell you is we will have public meetings to discuss a lot of different things on which the containment structure will be one of You know, and just, you, you, you made a comment that you hope that we have the right expert. Uh, I can guarantee you now, uh, because I've been setting up getting the right expertise. Uh, I, I hate to talk in lingo that most people don't know, but this is a very complex issue. Uh, you know, they're using a Gothic computer model to calculate the differential pressure from different accident scenarios, and how that it gets put into a GT Strudel finite element analysis. So it takes a lot of different experts understand all that, along with the structural engineering experts who I have going to the site, walking down containment, looking at actually how it was built so that we can assure it was modeled right in the computer models. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, I share with you the same feeling. We need to have the right people looking at the right things. And to tell you the truth, there's a lot of complex issues at this site, which is why, you know, one of my first statements was, licensee is ready for our inspections, they really need to be ready because it's not easy for me to get the right expertise for all these different issues. It takes time. And so, you know, just to get to your, your uh, I guess, the essence of what you're talking about, the NRC definitely shares with you, you know, the feeling that we need to get the right people I, I apologize for the way in which the meeting in December wasn't heard well. Uh, the phone system obviously did not work well at all. And uh, we, we will be having more public meetings. And I think you convinced us we probably will try to stay away from the double tree. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but anyways, uh, you know, to get to, get to your, your answer, uh, yes, we will be inspecting issue. We will be using our best, our best expertise to do it, and we will be communicating the results of our inspection activities, not only on the docket and on our special oversight website, but also in public meetings. I also would like to add that you brought up the point of extent of condition for issues to not be just isolated on every one issue that's being resolved. There are other ports, structures, or components that can be impacted by the ports. Yes, we are looking at that. And that is part of our inspections. And this uh, corrective action team that we just had, well, we did look at that. More than just did they just fix this issue, but that any problem possibly other systems that are important to safety as well. But also, we're going to be leading our uh, special inspection. Well, we look at the extended condition. Not only do we have the 
actuality dirty, dangerous, and expensive. And so we're focusing on safety, and OPPD's uh, slideshow presentation was uh, very impressive. They went from last to first in industrial safety overview, and last to maybe in the mid-30s in human performance overview. But, of course, these uh, numbers were from January 2012 to March of 2013. I believe the plant was closed all during that time. And since this is a uh, baseball season, then I'm going to use a small analogy here. It's like hitting 400 in, in spring training, but we all know that sometimes 400 hitters in spring training fail to really make it in, in, when regular season starts. So I guess uh, my question really is, how can the citizens of Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and everybody else that's downwind and downstream feel safe that the safety concerns that we've heard tonight are going to be taken care of? And we would like to see that the regular season doesn't start until we know all those safety issues are taken care of. So I, I guess that question might be to both the OPPD and to the NRC. Make us feel safe, please. Yeah, the, I, I, speaking on behalf of the OPPD, and, 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 and the NRC staff, we are going to conduct thorough and independent reviews of the action that we've identified on the confirmatory action letter and, and if necessary, modify the confirmatory action letter if necessary to make sure that the court of wounds is safe to restart. You know, I'd like to touch on, I'll start with the industrial safety statistics, statistics excuse me, and, and we did show, uh, you know, graphical representation also, the number of work activities, the number of, number of additional workers, the number of very complex activities that we're doing, and we're doing it injury-free. So as we've even seen in the nuclear industry, in, in some cases, we're going to be fueling outage, but there's that much coordination going on compared to normal power plant operations that uh, some utilities see a spike up in injuries during refuel outage. And we've always submitted an extended period with extended amount of additional work and so we're quite proud of that safety record. As we've inculcated with the employees, uh, when we do it safely, when we do it error-free, we're actually able to execute the schedule uh, as designed. And that extra time that we take in preparation, uh, in mitigation, in, uh, in additional eyes, additional oversight, additional supervision, is how we've been able to achieve both in getting it there safely, uh, as well as improving the efficiency of the station. We're going to talk about safety or even performance. And as I mentioned, with a lot of new workers and a lot of additional supplemental workers uh, supporting the work activities that we 